Welcome to my review of the Casio G-Shock GX56-1. This G-Shock was released in August of 2010, which is right about the time that Casio was switching over to the hexagonal tins, like this. Um, but as you can see, this came with the, whoops, this came with the older style, uh, sort of bronze colored tin. And, uh, yeah, this is the original packaging. I got this in September, I think, of 2010, and I never did a review of it. Shame on me. That's just the empty box. Um, yeah, so here's the user's manual, the, uh, the original tag. And this is, uh, I think this is a little something to do with the, op, uh, the solar. It is a tough solar G-Shock. However, it is not uh, solar atomic. So, anyway, uh, I think even before this watch was released, it was uh, it was already called the king of all. Oh, G oh. Somebody call for the king. Well, so one for the money, two for the show, three to get ready and go. No, 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 not you. No, I was talking about uh, the king of G-shocks. I, I don't know what a G-shock is, but you got the king of rock and roll, baby, right here, right now. Yeah, I can see that. Um, the thing is, I mean, what's this all about? Aren't you supposed to be dead? <laughs> now, didn't your mama never tell you that rock and roll can never die, son? Well, I don't want to kill rock and roll, but I might need it to relocate so I can just finish this G-Shock review. Uh, did you say relocate, son? Maybe Memphis. Or how about Nashville? Or better yet, Las Vegas. I like Vegas. I'm going to Vegas. See you later, little weirdo. I'm out of here. Viva Las Vegas. Viva. Viva. Holy crap. Wow. Well, whew. Man. That was interesting. Um, oh, I'm so stupid. I didn't think to... I didn't think to turn the camera. Well, anyway, um, who knew? Apparently, teleportation is all in the hips. Okay, so where was I? Um, as I was about to say before, um, even before this watch was released, it became known as the, um, the king of all g shots Okay, I guess, I guess we're safe now. Um, the original retail price for this was $150. Um, when this watch uh, was released in Japan, it was a multi-band 6 and tough solar. So it was um, a solar atomic, and it was about $300. Um so here in the United States, I guess Casio figured that Americans just wouldn't pay $300 for a digital watch. So they stripped out the multi-band 6 and um, sold it as a GX56, which is, you know, it just has the tough solar. Um, the module and the computer inside are essentially the same. They just have the uh, radio receivers turned off and disabled through the through the firmware, I guess. And, of course, there's no internal antenna for, so, I mean, even if you could enable the radio um, without the antenna, it probably wouldn't work very well. So, anyway, yeah, we that's what we got over here. We got the GX56, and this is more or less the plain vanilla version of the watch. So, the main features are that it, um, like I said, it's tough solar, so it uses light energy 
power from the solar panel to recharge the battery. It's also mud resist. It has a mud resist construction. Primarily you've got a membrane covering over the buttons and there's also a, a like a polyurethane back panel that uh, that seals the membrane to the to the case and to the case back and yeah mostly you know prevents dust and dirt from from getting into the watch and getting to the the stems of the buttons um, it's shock resist uh, 200 meter water resist it has a full auto electroluminescent backlight full auto means that um, if you hold the watch parallel to the ground and tilt it towards you, it will automatically light up, but only if it's dark. Um, it, uses, it uses data from the solar panel to determine whether or not you actually need the backlight. Um, so it doesn't light up during the daytime, it only lights up at night, so you can leave the full auto, or I should say you can leave the auto EL turned on all the time if you want, um, which is great. I love full auto. Um, it's got world time with UTC, it's got five alarms, a 24-hour countdown timer, and a 24-hour stopwatch. So I'll just run through the modes here quickly. There's a world time. There's the alarm. Stopwatch. Countdown timer. And then back to the home screen you notice there's a higher pitched beep when you get to the home screen. So let's talk about the construction of this watch. It has a polyurethane resin case. Casio calls it fine resin a lot of times. Um, it's fully concealed um, underneath all of these covers and you know the bezel is fully sheathed. Um, so you can't see the case. The Crystal is an inorganic glass or mineral glass. Um, the case back is stainless steel. However, it is also covered with a, um, a poly plastic um, additional mud and dust guard there. The buttons, you got four buttons. There's no separate light button. They have a knurled texture and it's sort of a, a semi-soft membrane. You're not actually touching the button itself. Um, so the buttons are a bit hard to push because the, the membrane doesn't have a great deal of give to it. Um, the strap attachment is a little different. It's like a keyway, sort of like a tongue and groove. And then there are also four screw pins. So it's not a full length screw bar as I would like it to be but you've got a screw pin on one side and a screw pin on the other and you know so there's four all together it's pretty secure because um, of the way that the strap locks into a channel in the in the in the watch case um, the strap is a polyurethane resin whoops I don't know, sometimes you can see the letters P-U-R on the strap, which is abbreviation for polyurethane. Don't seem to see many markings on this strap. But um, as you can see, it's got the, um, the, the two rows of holes. So it's a dual tang buckle. Um, this is, I think, the sturdiest, most stout macho buckle I've ever seen on a G-Shock and maybe ever has been on a G-Shock. Um, it seems to have a screw bar that goes all the way through it. In fact, I could not loosen. It has these tiny little Phillips head screws. So you need to use a very small screwdriver and it actually broke my screwdriver trying to loosen. So I don't know, maybe there's some thread lock on it. Um, this buckle can withstand a nuclear holocaust and just about anything you throw at it, I think. Um, it's heavy stainless steel. The strap keeper is just a rather ordinary um, 
polyurethane. So here it is on my seven and a half inch wrist. As you can see, it is almost as wide as my wrist. Um, it's quite large in comparison to the range man. The range man is definitely a sizable G-Shock, but um, the GX56 is a little bit bigger mainly because it's square so it displaces a lot of volume compared to the range man although the range man might be slightly wider at the at the widest point um, the GX56 is slightly over 17 millimeters I'd say the thickness is pretty comparable as well so um, It's definitely a big watch and the reason why I haven't worn it hardly at all, I've worn it maybe half a dozen times at the most, is because it's not comfortable. Some people don't mind having a watch that sort of flops around, you know, they wear their watch loose and it kind of flops around on their wrist. I can't stand that and because this watch is so heavy it tends to slide down, you know, and it hits against the back of your palm unless you tighten it up and when you tighten it up this buckle digs into the underside of your wrist um, because there's quite a bit of gap here on each side so the straps do not hug your wrist in this area which focuses a lot of the pressure down here on the buckle um, and what happens is because of the because of the size of this screw bar and these eyes here of the buckle they kind of dig into your wrist and over the course of you know an eight hour day of wearing this watch it um, you know I would have red marks I would have red marks on my wrist here and actually start to get uh, rashes and stuff so um yeah that's <clears throat> mainly why well actually exclusively why I mean if this watch had been comfortable I would have worn it a lot because I do like the looks of it it has a negative display um, which makes it a little hard to read the digits um, you know the the case is so huge the module looks kinda tiny in there and the display is is not exceptionally large but um, the fact that it's a negative display makes it difficult to read unless you're in bright sunlight or, you know, bright daylight. If you have good lighting, it's not too bad. And if you turn on the illumination at night, it's certainly easy to read. But in lower light situations, especially indoors, it can be really hard to uh, to read the time. You have to sort of tilt it this way and that, you know, to try to get uh, a handle on all of the information there. As I mentioned earlier, the buttons, um, that's a bit of a struggle, you know. I mean, if you need something that's not available on the screen, you do have to push pretty hard in order to get the buttons to activate. They're definitely sizable enough, and they have a good grip to them with that with that knurled texture but they're just they're just hard to push that's all so as with any G-Shock it's a shock resistant construction um, now given the size of this case and the fact that unlike most G-Shocks this G-Shock incorporates alpha gel um, at the 3, 6, 9 and 12 o'clock positions and basically what that means is that the electronics module, which the display is part of, floats inside the watch. Um, you know, I mean, it doesn't slosh around, you know, it, under normal, um, normal situations. It, it stays in place. But it's like a, a car with a, a passenger or an occupant inside the car. If you have an accident, say you're going 50 miles an hour, you crash into a cement wall. 
The car stops, but you keep going 50 miles an hour for a little while. Uh, hopefully you're wearing your seat belt and then you'll hit the seat belt and that'll cause you to start slowing down quite rapidly. Uh, if you're not wearing a seat belt, then hopefully you have an airbag and you hit the airbag and that'll slow you down. So the airbag is kind of like the alpha gel. Uh, so when this watch falls, the case hits the ground and the case stops moving, but the module is actually able to keep moving for a little bit as it um, enjoys the cushioning effect of the alpha gel. Uh, so it slows down more slowly, which reduces that impact force to the point where nothing breaks in the in the electronics and in the liquid crystal display and so on. All the important, the, the, the fragile stuff, none of it breaks. Normally G-Shocks are designed, they're engineered to survive a 10 meter drop or about 33 feet. This one, given the the size of the case and the alpha gel and everything, I would think it would be able to survive even more than that, but I, I don't think that Casio ever advertised it as being like a 20 meter drop shock resistant or, you know, especially more shock resistant. Um, but um, it's definitely got to be, I would think, you know, I mean, just based on appearance, that probably the toughest G Shock that's ever come down the pike. Um, the battery is a probably, um, and this is not published, so I don't know for sure, but it's probably a CTL 1616 from Panasonic because that's what most Casio solar atomic watches use. It's a rechargeable battery. Um, if you take good care to make sure that the charge level stays up in the high or the medium area, medium to high. Potentially, I guess they can last 25 years. They should last a long time. However, if you let the charge run down by keeping it in the dark, you know, maybe putting it in some box that you have for watches and then closing the lid and leaving it there for months, um, when the charge runs down to less than medium and then further, the lower it goes, the more you damage the battery. And so then who knows, your, your life lifespan of the battery might be completely terminated, uh, you know, after spending a year in a box. The accuracy is plus or minus 15 seconds per month, which is pretty good. Um, it's kind of the normal um, G-Shock. I think every G-Shock ever made has plus or minus 15 se second per month accuracy. It, uh, as I mentioned before, it does not have the atomic uh, clock radio receiver inside so it cannot automatically correct itself. So let's take a look at the illumination. The uh, top right button is the light button. It is um, electroluminescent so it works very nicely. It's very even. Now you might notice above the above the seconds there is a tiny little indicator A period EL and it's not on right now but if I press and hold the light button it will turn on so now you can see it that means that auto EL is turned on so if you hold it roughly parallel to the ground and then tilt it towards you there's a tilt sensor which will activate the illumination. And the solar panel allows the watch to know whether you actually need the illumination. So like right now, the illumination is not activating because there's enough energy coming from the solar panel so that the watch decides that there's enough light, ambient light, so that the illumination is not needed. Uh, now when I turn the light my ambient light off and tilt it. Now it comes on. So full auto EL is the shiznit. Um, now there's also an adjustable afterglow. If you press and hold the adjust button
and then use the mode button to go through the settings eventually you will come to yeah LT and you can change this to LT1 or LT3 when it's uh, when it's on LT1 you have about a one and a half second afterglow and if it's on LT3 you have a three second afterglow and that just means that once the light is activated it will stay on for either one and a half or three seconds after either the tilt activation or after you press and release the button actually even if you don't release the button it'll only stay on for the the set afterglow time so let's take a look at the functions of this GX56 up at the top you see here water 20 uh, 20 bar resist that's uh, 20 atmospheres or 200 meters um, there are labels for the buttons but they're so tiny I don't know who can read those down here is the battery charge indicator low medium and high you want to keep it up here in the medium high area it only takes about five minutes of exposure to sunlight during the daytime to provide all of the power that the watch needs for that day so it doesn't need a lot but um, in certain situations it can be problematic if you wear long sleeves and you have the watch covered all the time you might not have enough light exposure to keep the battery charged up and so you want to keep track of where this charge indicator is um, there are also tiny indicators down here for snooze alarm and hourly chime if those are turned on or off DST means that day daylight savings time is turned on auto EL PS is for power saving so it's day of the week, month, day of the month, and time. It's in showing military 24-hour time right now. Um, of course, the top right button is the illumination. Um, bottom right button does nothing. The mode, of course, switches modes. The adjust button, if you press it momentarily, it'll show you your uh, world time up here at the top, which is kind of a handy feature that not a lot of G-Shocks have. So currently the world time is set for UTC or universal coordinated time. And pressing the adjust button again momentarily. If you press and hold the adjust button, it'll take you into the settings. But if you just press it momentarily, it'll switch between, um, you know, day of the week and world time. Um, so now what I'm going to do is press and hold the... Uh, the adjust button over here at the top left and now you can see this is flashing this is your home city it's currently set to Denver because I'm in the mountain time zone and um, so you want to set that depending on what time zone you live in in the world you want to find a city that's in the same time zone and then set it to that city um, so there's a lot of city codes in here. I think there's 31. And, oh, how about that? I can go backwards. All right, so I'll press the mode button on the bottom left. This is where you turn uh, daylight savings time on or off. And this is where you can switch between 12-hour display. So you can see now there's a a p.m. indicator here um, 12 or 24 hour display press the mode button again you can adjust the seconds you can adjust the hours using these um, two right side buttons you can go up and down and do the same thing with the minutes you can adjust the year it has a full auto calendar until the year 2099, so it knows which years are leap years, and it automatically adds the 29th day of February on leap years. Uh, I'm going to adjust the month, the day of the month, and this is for button muting. 
if you have mute selected, then your buttons won't make any sounds when you press them. And that's with the, the signal turned on. And uh, I cover this in the illumination. This is where you can adjust your illumination afterglow for either one and a half seconds. That's one and a half seconds or three seconds. And power saving. You can either turn that on or off. It should be on. I mean, that's it's just good practice to leave it on. That way, between the hours of 10 p.m. and 6 a.m., if the watch isn't moving and it's in the dark, it will turn the display off. And if it continues to not move and stays in the dark for a prolonged period of time, it will go into a deeper sleep where the alarm is deactivated. Um, it's all to prevent drainage of the battery under the assumption that you've forgotten about it. And, um, you know, if it's not moving and it's not getting power from the solar panel, then it needs to conserve energy. So it, when you pick it up in the morning uh, with power saving turned on, the display might be off, but as soon as you start moving it and the, and the tilt sensor activates, it'll turn back on. The display will light back up. So I always, I always have power saving turned on on my Tough Solar G-Shocks. Let's look at world time. It's currently on UTC. Um, so you cannot you can only go forwards because there's the light button is taking your reverse away from you or your decrement. You can only move westward, I believe, in the um, in the city codes here. So if you um, press and hold the adjust button, you can turn daylight savings time on or off for that particular city code. And they're all independent. So like it's turned on for Denver right now, but it's not turned on for Mexico City or Chicago or, well, I must have turned it on for New York City at some point. Um, yeah, so they're all independently settable that way. If you press and uh, the two right buttons simultaneously, it will send you instantly to universal coordinated time. Kind of a handy little feature that gets forgotten, and most people either don't know or they forget about it. Um, yeah, so that's the world time mode. Let's take a look at the um, alarm mode. You got five alarms. So I'm pressing the search button, the bottom right button here. There's alarm one, alarm two, alarm three, alarm four. And alarm five is a snooze alarm. So this is the hourly chime. Um, I think pressing the adjust button, yeah. Press the adjust button at the top left. That turns that on or off. It's a double beep at the top of the hour. It's not adjustable. It's always the top of the hour. There's alarm one. You can turn it on or off by momentarily pressing the adjust button and you can set it. And I don't know if you can go. Yeah, you can go backwards. These are just daily alarms. They're not multifunction alarms. Just daily alarms. So this will sound at 7 a.m. in the morning if it's turned on. And it'll do that every day, unless you turn it off, of course. Same with this one, same with this one, same with this one. Now this one will act as a snooze alarm. So it'll go off, it'll sound at 7 a.m. And if you press a button, it'll stop beeping. And then it will sound again five minutes later and again five minutes after that and it does that I think seven times unless you press and hold the adjust button and go into the settings and then it will it will no longer sound after that so it I mean some Casio G-Shocks have a fifth alarm where you can turn the snooze on or off but with this one the snooze is always on. 
Let's take a look at the stopwatch mode. It's a regular 24-hour uh, stopwatch. It functions like almost, well, the majority of Casio stopwatches out there. Stop, start, stop button down, down here at the bottom right. And the adjust button over here at the top left is what zeroes it out, resets it. Um, and you can do split times by pressing the adjust button while it's running. It freezes the display. You see SPL up here for split. And the stopwatch is still running in the background. So if you press the adjust button again, you can see where the elapsed time currently is. And you can just keep doing that. You'll have to write the numbers down if you're like recording lap times or something. If you want to do first and second place finish, then you want to press the adjust button for first place and then press the stop button, uh, the search button over here for the second place. And so here's your first place time still on the display. And when you press the adjust button, it shows you your final stop time and then press it again, resets it. Um, so it counts up to 23 hours, 59 minutes, and 0.99 seconds, and then it starts at zero again, and it just keeps repeating that cycle. So it's a 24-hour capacity. And the hours, as you might guess, are shown up here. So you've got hundreds of a second, seconds, minutes, and hours. The time is not displayed. I should say the, the home time is not displayed. Um, you know, here's your home time, 1626. That is not displayed on the screen. It is in the alarm mode, but in stopwatch mode and timer mode, it is not displayed. What's shown up here is what your timer is set to. So after you, after you start it running, um, it'll show you where the countdown currently is and then what you had it set to originally. Which brings up the timer mode. Now for the countdown timer. It's a 24 hour countdown timer. When it's set to zero, that's the same as 24 hours. So if I press the start button down here at the bottom right, it'll count down as if that was 24 hours. So now I'll stop it, use the adjust button at the top left to reset it to zero. If you press and hold the adjust button, of course, that's when you go into the flashing settings and you can set this for, you can set your hours up and down using the two right side buttons and you can set the minutes. So here's a one minute countdown. You cannot set the seconds, of course. You can see that they're, they're blacked out. Um, so now when I press the adjust button, it shows what I have it set for. And then when I press start, so this is the countdown and that's what it was originally set for. When it gets to zero, the watch will beep for 10 seconds. There's no auto repeat feature and there's no progress beeper. And there's no flash alert with this watch. So the illumination will not flash with the, um, the beeping. and it auto resets to the original set time. Okay, so there's the Casio G-Shock GX56. If you're well over six and a half feet tall and your first name is either Hulk or Tiny, this is probably the perfect G-Shock for you. If you're planning to head over Niagara Falls in a barrel, um, this might also be the G-Shock for you. Um, it won't protect you from law enforcement, but It'll probably survive the drop. It's definitely a G-Shock for really, really big risks. 
if you want to have an impromptu hockey game and you have everything but a puck, you can always drop this down onto the ice. It's a big chunk of urethane. I think that's pretty much the same stuff they make hockey pucks out of. And it'll probably still be good after the game's over. Probably still be running. Sounds like an experiment. Well, actually, since these aren't in production anymore, um, they're probably going to increase in collector value a little bit. I don't know. It's all urethane, so you got to keep them in the dark. Um, UV light exposure will cause the the resin. You got to keep them dry and in the dark, so that the resin doesn't rot out. Well, anyway. Thanks for watching, thanks for liking and subscribing if you do, and I'll see you next time.